Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good Monday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It is February the 23rd. As always, we encourage your community and your village to stay up to date on your local weather information by going to weather.gov slash Alaska, arh.noaa.gov, or listening to the forecast on Marine VHF or NOAA Weather Radio. You can always give us a call on the weather info line on the phone, 800-472-0391. Find information about your weather during the day on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. If you're using Twitter, make sure you're using the hashtag AKWX. That's short for Alaska Weather, and that helps the forecasters around all of Alaska see your weather information and share that with our local communities as well. And on YouTube, around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you'll get your daily afternoon map briefing, the same maps that you see here just a little bit earlier in your day. And if you're on your cell phone, it works really well. It's just a little bit of bandwidth. It gives you a lot of information to get you on about your business and help keep you safe. Here's a look at the hazardous weather that we see across the upper Tanana Valley and around the 40 mile country. Generally north of the upper Tanana Valley, we're looking for uh, areas uh, could see less than a tenth of an inch of freezing rain. But these are winter storm warnings and conditions in some places could see anywhere from a tenth to three tenths of an inch of additional ice. Uh, now these are expected to drop off around six o'clock. So conditions should be improving right now as we speak. But at least for a little bit while longer, the winter storm warnings are still in effect for the eastern parts of the interior and along the Alcan border there. So it sounds like conditions have not been all that pleasant today as that warm and wet air has been moving over the interior. Now snow is on the way back. You can see that as you look out across the Bering Sea, several waves of low pressure are working from west to east. Each one of these is a disruption in the weather flow that we have around Alaska. And each one of these will probably have a little bit more colder air behind it. So conditions are trying to change back to winter for many of us, especially on the west coast and southwest. And each one of these could produce at least a little bit of snow, the first of which is coming into the north and western coast. You can see this boundary working from west to east slowly and surely. And as it does so, uh, many across the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys, the Seward Peninsula, and even Norton Sound and generally north of St. Mary's will have an opportunity for at least a couple inches of snow in the next couple days, maybe a little bit more than that as you head into the uh, western, southern uh, facing slopes of the Brooks Range. So this would be the area that probably has the best chance of seeing accumulating snow in the next coming days, but there will be some other opportunities spreading northward as well. You can see how this wave looks north of St. Paul and then the next wave that was a little bit further south in our latest picture there. In the meantime, though, high pressure is trying to take charge of the Gulf of Alaska. It's slowly, slowly working the clouds out of southeast. Not a really uh, fast plan earlier today. Uh, many in southeast saw a pretty good soaker. Cordova picked up, I think, 1.7 inches of rainfall in the last 24 hours. A very wet day there. Juneau, about a half inch. Sitka and Yakutat saw about 7 tenths of an inch. So pretty soggy stuff right in here. And there will still be some rainfall across the north and eastern Gulf Coast. Across the west, though, more and more drier air has been working in from the south and the west around Cook Inlet and southwestern Alaska. Watch the loop one more time, and you can see that general flow from southwest to north and east still taking clouds through the interior in the middle Tanana Valley. Uh, and again, uh, snowfall uh, still kind of at a premium there, but at least Fairbanks right now, uh, as of the last report this afternoon, you have about 11 inches of snow on the ground. Uh, temperatures were hovering around 32, which is a little bit on the warm side for you, but uh, you may be one of the places that has some of the most snow across a large part of the state right now. So impressive stuff. Enjoy that while it lasts. Here's a look at today's weather. And once again, just look at these waves lined up from west to east with a southwesterly flow in the jet stream. This type of trend will continue for the next couple days. High pressure sitting out across the Gulf at 1,027 millibars there. Several waves of low pressure uh, attached to uh, cold fronts. That's dragging at least a little bit of a change along with it. 
Uh, that helped to ring out the wetter air across northern parts of southeast to Yakutat out toward Cordova late this afternoon. Snow was falling around the Kotzebue Sound region from Shishmaref north to Kivalina and a little bit further north into the Chukchi Sea Coast. And we were still watching for some blowing snow around the central and eastern Beaufort Sea Coast there. Uh, conditions had not been reaching blizzard criteria yet, which is good, but uh, still you might run into some poor visibility as those winds pick up. And we still expect those uh, areas to see some light snow showers, we'll say scattered snow showers for now, and uh, blowing and drifting snow, but probably not uh, for a very long period of time. So watch for some intermittent uh, poor visibility with that. A look further south shows, shows high pressure moving toward the southeastern coastline at 1,030 millibars. The southerly flow working through the central and western gulf is bringing up more wet and warm air across the western gulf. A lot of this will start moving toward Kodiak Island as we head into early tomorrow morning. Out across the west, scattered snow showers from the western tip of the Seward Peninsula and northward of the Bering Strait down toward St. Matthew and westward still. And you'll notice the packing of those pressure gradient lines, the isobars that we call uh, these black lines here across the western chain. Uh, we're probably looking at uh, high gales as we move out toward Shemya and Atu as we get into tonight and early tomorrow morning. Across southeast, still scattered precipitations expected across the region. Some areas may lean over to a partly to mostly cloudy sky, but there's still an opportunity for some wet weather as we head into Tuesday. More and more areas in the interior, especially the lower Yukon and the lower Kuskokwim, will be looking at a partly to mostly cloudy day, so a little more sunshine for you. Still looking at accumulating snow for the Seward Peninsula, Norton Sound, north of Unalakleet, up toward the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys, and into Kotzebue and areas around the Red Dog Mine. Frontal boundary will linger across the Yukon and the eastern Beaufort Sea Coast toward Kaktovik, Prudhoe Bay, and Dead Horse. In those areas, the winds may gust from time to time, and you may have scattering of snow showers. Low pressure across the central and western Gulf is also working northward, and again, that's just going to kind of sneak up on Kodiak Island a little bit and give areas through Shelikoff Strait and Sand Point a little bit of a stronger breeze from time to time, scattered areas of rain and snow on the northern side there. The colder air is trying to work across the western chain, and as it does so, attached to a 983 millibar low. Periods of rain and snow may be found there. Uh, that system will quickly move to the north and east on that strong southwesterly jet aloft, pushing that storm quickly into the Bering Strait. will surge warm air up through the Bering Strait. St. Lawrence Island, St. Matthew Island waters, and maybe even bring rain across the Aleutians there. Uh, depending on exactly how warm that is. And we'll find out more information in the next 24 hours as uh, the weather buoys and the satellite picture gets a little bit better taste of this weather system. High pressure across the middle Yukon Valley, 1,033 millibars, should trap some colder air down near the surface, but it should also help to break up some of the clouds across the interior, across the Cook Inlet, down toward Bristol Bay and southwest. Low pressure sitting across the Gulf will have an occlusion wrapped all the way around it. That should push some rainfall up into the northern Gulf Coast and southeast once again, looking at uh, widespread but generally light rainfall there. Snow showers will be confined to areas around the Alcan and uh, most areas into southern Yukon and British Columbia. That's the way your surface weather looks for right now. Let's take a look at the temperatures now across the southeast. Look for most areas today, uh, generally in the mid-40s, from Sitka to Juneau, all the way down toward Ketchikan and Annette, uh, the Queen Charlotte region, and Haida Gwaii in the upper 40s. Around Prince William Sound, remember Cordova saw over 1.7 of inches of rain today. 40 degrees there, so it was a very wet but mild day. 36 around Valdez. Lower 40s around the Kenai Peninsula. Kodiak Island also in the lower 40s. Up into the Susitna Valley, we saw many areas approaching that 40 degree mark. Squintna was 41. Talkeetna made it well into the 30s today. As you cross over the hills into Fairbanks, holding at 30, it was 32 for the high again today. Eagle and Northway saw temps at or above freezing. Fort Yukon was 27, Arctic Village 19 degrees, Anaktuvik Pass was 27, the Arctic Coast even saw pretty warm weather. Most areas there in the single digits, Barrow though dropped below zero to three below. 11 above in Kaktovik around the Kotzebue Sound area, 20s and 30s there, 21 in Nome, 24 in Unalakleet, Grayling was 30, McGrath 37, Sparabon saw temps in the mid 30s as well, 29 around Bethel. The Bristol Bay region was back in the mid to upper 30s. Pribilovs at or above freezing today. And most of the Alaska Peninsula was looking at temps in the upper 30s to lower 40s, including Sand Point and False Pass. 38 around Unalaska and Dutch Harbor. The Pribilovs also, again, warm, as I think I just said that. And uh, Adak and Atka in the upper 30s and 30 for Attu. Now, on to overnight low temperatures. For the interior, look for most areas to stay above zero but below freezing. Teens and 20s for you out across the west in the Seward Peninsula. Low to mid-teens in most places. Nome 12, Barrow down to 4 below, uh, Kodiak 30, 
as the Alaska Peninsula in the 20s and 30s there. The Pribilovs 23, mid 20s for the central Aleutians and southeast. Most areas above freezing, mid to upper 30s and a few places along the coast, generally lower 40s with south central in the upper 20s. High temperatures tomorrow back in the mid to upper 30s. Above freezing for south central again, Kodiak at 40. Upper 30s for the Alaska Peninsula and most areas in the chain will be similar. 33 around St. Paul, the interior in the middle Tanana Valley in the upper 20s, Bethel and areas northward in the upper 20s there toward Nome, 25, Barrow, 19, or 9 degrees and Kotzebue looking at temperatures in the low 20s. Same goes for Shishmaref and southeast looking at high temperatures tomorrow in the upper 30s to even mid 40s around Sitka, Ketchikan, Craig and Klawak. On to your flying weather now, we still expect IFR conditions, especially in the morning uh, for areas closer to the hills and the northern Lynn Canal up toward Haines and Skagway and probably westward toward Gustavus. And across the north, conditions should gradually improve across the Brooks Range, but look for IFR conditions east of Point Barrow all the way out toward Kaktovik and Demarcation Point. And then across the Bering Strait, look for IFR conditions there southward of Tin City and still around Nome and westward. And pockets of IFR developing across the western Bering Sea. Otherwise, MDFR will be hit and miss across the Bering and across the Gulf with improving conditions around the Alaska Range. And at Tuvik Pass, again, we expect some improvements during the day heading for VFR. Same goes for Attigan Pass. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, we expect to see some pretty quick improvements in the morning hours, so watch for VFR by afternoon. Same goes for Rainy and Windy Pass. Look for VFR to develop fairly quickly. Isabel Pass, we expect to see marginal conditions in the morning heading for VFR. Then Tasta Pass looks to see improved visibility during the daytime, looking at VFR by the afternoon. And the same goes for Tanita Pass. Look for improvements there. Portage Pass, we expect to see a partly sunny sky by the afternoon. So again, it looks like a brighter day for many in South Central. Chilkoot and White Pass also looking for improvements, but probably holding on to IFR a little bit longer in the afternoon. We'll see if clearing takes shape. If that's the case and the process starts up, VFR conditions should be realized. The freezing levels are showing very little change in that surface freezing line, hugging the Gulf Coast as it seems to want to do all the time around the Chilikov Strait and then south of the Pribilovs, but just barely. Uh, the amount of warmer air is shrinking back just a little bit, but we still have plenty of it available around the Gulf of Alaska from two, four, even 6,000 foot freezing levels south of Haida Gwaii. You can see that uh, 2,000 foot line there around uh, oh, Juneau and just right across Cross Sound. Icing potential is hit and miss across the north, below 8,000 feet across the upper Kobuk and Noatak valleys, close to where some of that snow potential is a little bit higher, of course. And then across the Beaufort Sea coast down into western Canada, wrapping around the occlusion that's working to the Gulf, that's generally above 3,000 feet. And way out across the west with the next wave of low pressure working across the western chain, that's above 3,000 feet as well. Some of that could reach occasional moderate. As we look at the jet stream, remember I was talking about that southwesterly flow aloft. Well, this is it. That powerful force of air that's working around the planet uh, is coming at the Bering Sea right now from a southwesterly orientation. And at the surface, it's driving each one of those weather systems in along this path. And as it does that, it's also being reinforced by that colder air working into the Gulf. The main storm track right now is still well to the south, and that's where a lot of the active weather is making it into the lower 48 states. And the brunt of the cold weather right now has been tilted a little bit more into the lower 48 in western Canada with this pattern of the jet stream a little bit further east of Alaska. So right now our weather is following this track and coming in from the south and west with wind speeds between 70 and 150 knots there way out in the west. At 9,000 feet, you can see that southwesterly flow reflected at this level, anywhere from 25 to about 35 knots or so, the strongest of which is out at the western Aleutians, from 35 to about 50 knots there. And again, we should expect some turbulence at this level and a little bit uh, below that, as well as uh, probably some uh, decrease in visibility as that uh, wet air is starting to work into colder waters. Low pressure is also pushing stronger southerly winds uh, across the Gulf between 30 and 50 knots and a ridge of high pressure still seen showing up across southeastern Alaska. At this level, the winds again coming in from the south between 35 and 50 knots. Most of those stronger winds though are diminishing quickly as they reach the coast. At 3,000 feet, our southwesterly flow is still pretty evident here. Moving across the bearing at 30 to 50 knots, circulation just south of Kodiak Island, bringing winds in from the north and east across Shelikov Strait and the Alaska Peninsula between 20 and 40 knots. Stronger winds noted out over the open waters of the Gulf, but they slow down significantly from the north and west, crossing over the outer coastline, and that ridge of high pressure extends all the way up toward the Alcan border. Across the Arctic coast, wind speeds there coming in from the south and west, around 25 to 30 knots or so. And most areas will experience very little turbulence, it looks like, on any large scale. Most of that should be on the western Brooks Range, generally below 3,000 feet and south of the Bering Strait, some of that reaching occasional widespread moderate. I should have colored these areas in blue here, so 
uh, my, my fault there, across the western chain below 8,000 feet and also across the southern, uh, uh, the western Kodiak uh, Island region out across uh, the Sand Point area in the western Gulf, probably below 5,000 feet again to reach occasional moderate, uh, not the isolated severe. Let's look at your aviation forecast. We'll be back with an update on the sea ice edge. It is on the move northward once again, and we'll look at your marine weather forecast, so stay tuned. Good evening, I'm Harry Keeling, and on behalf of Alaska Public Media and the Alaskan Aviation Safety Foundation, welcome to Hangar Flying. Our guest this evening is Melissa Hartford, who is a very enthusiastic student pilot here in Anchorage. Melissa has lived all over the world, including Ramstein, Germany, as her father was a career Air Force officer. She's been in Alaska for six years, and she graduated from UAA with a degree in accounting. Melissa, welcome to Hangar Flying. Hi. Let's talk about your flying. You are just about to solo. How'd you first get interested in flying? Um, well, I first got interested in my first experience flying. Um, I had the opportunity to fly in a beaver with a group of people over to Whittier. And uh, in that short flight, I was absolutely amazed with everything that I saw. Uh, the wildlife, um, the mountains, just everything was so beautiful and spectacular and uh, would put anybody in awe. Have you flown much? Um uh, after that? Uh, yes, I've had several opportunities to fly with um, several friends who are in aviation and pilots and um, my uh, uh, I was just inspired to start flying um, this last summer so. So now you're trying to get your license? Uh, yes, I'm working so on it now. So you, um, you completed ground school at UAA, right? Mm -hmm. Were you flying at the same time? Uh, yes, I found uh, my CFI is Jamie Symes Patterson and she is the owner and operator of Skytrek Alaska out of Merrill Field and uh, she is great. Uh, Jamie is a very successful woman, CFI, and I'm glad to hear you. she's your instructor. Let's talk a little bit about women in aviation. Um, the fact of the matter is the number of females is still well below the National Geographic of male and females. I would call you a role model for young aspiring female pilots because you're getting your license. But what, what is your vision for women in aviation? Um, I would love to see more. Um, I've met a lot of female aviators in Alaska and everyone I've spoken with just has the most inspiring wild experiences and stories to tell and I hope that one day I can have the same of my own stories to tell. Well let's let's say you have because I, I mean you've already you got probably 20 or so hours you're gonna solo you've got stories to tell um, you've probably got some advice. How, what kind of advice would you give a young woman who's out there in the audience saying, you know what, I might like to become a pilot? Um, I think for young women and uh, anyone who wants to become a pilot in general, I think it's very important to shop around for the right CFI uh, because they will play a huge role in shaping the pilot you become. Um, how about frequency of flying? Um, I fly once a week, but I almost feel like it's not enough. Um, I would say fly as much as you can, at minimum twice a week. Um, when you're first starting to learn flying, it's a lot to take in, it's a lot to absorb, and after every lesson, um, I find myself very mentally exhausted. It's hard work. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> um, one of the questions I always ask my guests, regardless of their experiences, um, what one improvement or procedure would, do you think would make flying safer in Alaska? Um, well, before I took started flight instruction, I didn't understand, I, I didn't know that a, uh, pilots had to do pre-flight inspection. And everyone I've flown with before never did a pre-flight inspection. And so I think that's critical because in a lot of the articles I've read for airplane crashes, it seems like a lot of lives could have been spared if they would have checked something before they took off. And I would definitely say, uh, don't ever think it won't happen to you. Sure. So maybe there's another nugget in there uh, in that because you're becoming a pilot, you may see things that some of your friends or people you fly with, you don't want to emulate. There may be th some things you would like to, you know, the good pilots, but but the fact of the matter is we've, uh, um, and pre-flight is one of them. The other thing I would recommend is doing a post-flight. Very, even fewer pilots 
do post flights. But sometimes you can discover damage that was done to the airplane that you didn't know was there. So, um, your solo is coming up. Uh, should be very soon. Talk about that. Um, are you excited? Are you nervous? Or? I'll, I'll probably be excited and very nervous at the same time, but um, I'll pull it together and make it happen. <laughs> what part of your training is the hardest? Is it landing? Um, no, actually, the most difficult. Uh, my my biggest difficulty in flying was tower communications. Um, I don't know why. I would just find myself. I, I would freeze up, and my flight instructor would have to take over for me. But I've definitely um, overcome that, and I'm a lot more proficient now. Well, you know, that's you're not alone, and and even amongst in experienced pilots, good communication with the uh, ground control is it's a it's a real art. The only thing I would suggest from a few years of experience is find a place, quiet place around the house and practice it without, without anybody listening, but just practice what your calls are, you know, who you are, where you are, what you want. But, um, well, I'm, I want, I'm excited. I want to hear about your experience on your solo, and I really appreciate you being on the program tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed tonight's program brought to you by the Alaska Aviation Safety Foundation. Remember, we're supported by people like you, members of our society, our foundation. Please go on our website and renew your uh, membership for 2015 if you haven't, www.aasfonline.org. Until next time, fly safe. Thanks, Harry. We'll check in with you again on Friday. Here's a look at today's sea ice edge as analyzed by our Alaska sea ice desk experts there. And uh, you can see the sea ice edge now in that area of open water has expanded north of St. Paul. We expect that in the coming days this will shift a little bit further north, about 20 to 30 nautical miles or so. So uh, if you're looking for more space in the bearing, you can find it there. This is all brought to us courtesy of that warmer weather working in on that southwesterly flow we were talking about. The ice is also lifting northward across Cook Inlet there, uh, still south of Calgon Island, but uh, we're seeing some more openings there, and we still have some ice closer to the shore from Dillingham out toward Naknek and northward toward Nunavak Island. So anytime you want to check this out, you can do that by going to weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice.php. Even more importantly there, you can find the five-day outlook there if you're looking to track that sea ice edge. Now across southeast, look for light winds across the inner coast, five to ten knots or so from the south across the Lynn Canal. Variable winds in the in the middle there, more of a northwesterly flow down toward Clarence Strait. Two-foot seas there in the inside and across coastal areas with high pressure setting up. Look for winds maybe ten to fifteen knots or so. Six-foot seas in the north and the south for Tuesday. By the time we get to Wednesday, the winds are starting to pick up a little bit more. You can see an offshore flow around 20 to 25 knots, 9 foot seas in most areas along the outer coast, and 4 foot seas on the inner coast, 20 knots there. Generally a northerly flow coming down the Cook Inlet into uh, Stevens Passage and areas southward into Clarence Strait should have a little bit more of a dominant southeasterly wind with 4 foot seas. Across south central, a light and variable wind across the uh, the ice that remains across northern Cook Inlet, a south or a northeasterly flow coming down past Calgan Island. Easterly is coming across the Barrens at 15 to 20 knots and into Kodiak Island as high as 30 knots with a 12 foot sea. Light and variable winds inside and outside of Prince William Sound and south of Resurrection Bay, 15 knots there with a six foot sea. Those winds start to pick up a little bit more on. Wednesday, as low pressure is working northward, uh, those winds will be drawn in a little bit faster. 10 to 25 knots across the north and western Gulf. Still fairly light inside of Prince William Sound and across northern Cook Inlet. North and westerly winds now coming across the Barrens. The wind speeds on the eastern side of Kodiak, strongest in south central at 35 knots with a 14 foot sea on Wednesday. For Alaska Peninsula, about 15 knots over Bristol Bay. Two foot seas there in the ice free waters. North and easterly winds south of the peninsula with seas ranging from 11 to as high as 11 feet. Northerly is also coming into uh, the Bering Sea coast at 20 knots with a 5-foot sea. Those should turn a little bit more to the north and east on Wednesday. Northwesterly is inside of Bristol Bay at up to 10-foot seas are expected there. Northeasterly south of Castle Cape, 30 knots with a 14-foot sea. A little bit further south towards Sand Point. Northwesterlies take over at 20 knots with a 10-foot sea. 
A pretty hard difference here there from the eastern Aleutians. You'll see more of a northerly flow cutting across 15 to 25 knots as we get into Tuesday. Eight foot seas south of Unalaska and Nikolsky. To the west of that though, much stronger southerly winds begin to develop. The strongest of which will be out across the western chain. 45 knots with a 17 foot sea there on Tuesday. That diminishes a little bit on Wednesday. Uh, coming in from the south and west with a 19 foot sea. 40 knots over Kiska with a 20 foot sea. Otherwise, southerlies continue all the way to Nikolsky. 25 to 35 knots across the central chain. And then we still hold on to some northerlies just south of Unalaska and Nikolsky at 25 knots with an 8 foot sea. So it's a little bit of change there as we head through Tuesday and Wednesday for the chain. Across the west coast, southerlies coming up over St. Paul and St. George with a 7 foot sea. Southwesterlies coming into the coast. Uh, into the Kuskokwim Bay with a two foot sea on a 15 knot wind. Southerlies continue northward toward the St. Lawrence Island sea coast with a 25 knot wind. 10 foot seas there in the ice free waters around St. Matthew. Those strengthen as we get into Wednesday there with a 35 knot wind and a 12 foot sea. Southerlies also pick up around the Pribilovs to 25 knots. Southeasterlies across the southwest coast with a one foot sea there again in the ice free waters for Wednesday. And across the Arctic coast, a southeasterly flow just outside of Kotzebue Sound. Otherwise, southerlies still working up the Chukchi Sea coast and diminishing to 10 to about 15 knots. South and easterly winds also working offshore from Prudhoe Bay to Kaktovik at 15 to 20 knots. As we get into Wednesday, the winds will pick up a little bit more on the Chukchi Sea coast. 30 knots for most areas south of Point Barrow all the way into Kotzebue Sound. Otherwise, south and westerly winds continue north of Prudhoe Bay. Those increase to 25 knots and we have a light westerly wind over Kaktovik. So this will be your day off from the wind it looks like as we head into the midweek. Recapping tonight's weather, the soggy weather across the northern parts of the Gulf will continue in some cases as we head into tonight and tomorrow. From Cordova eastward toward Yakutat is the best chance of rainfall there and another surge of warmer, wetter air is working northward. Out across the west, we'll see storm systems line up here. There's waves of colder air trying to march toward the western coast, and that means a better chance for accumulating snow in the upper Kobuk and Noatak Valleys in areas westward and probably as far south as St. Mary's and the Yukon Delta. A frontal boundary will linger across the northern uh, coast and the eastern Beaufort Sea coast into the Yukon. That'll provide a focus for a few scattered showers from time to time. A new stronger storm will work its way into the western bearing with a much hardier southwesterly flow and that'll bring some warmer, wetter air northward as far north as the Bering Strait. That's a look at your Alaska weather. Thanks for watching. See you again tomorrow. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. Indie Alaska is an innovative weekly web series capturing the diverse and colorful lifestyle of Alaskans. Real stories of everyday Alaskans at work and play. Supported in part by Alaska Pipeline Service Company. The National Weather Service.